All right, so welcome back for part two. Um, so now we're going to switch focus, move ourselves out of uh, Africa and into one of the great empires of the Middle East, and that is the Persian Empire. All right, um, so I want to go a little bit into the background of the Persians because I feel like the book kind of neglects it a little bit. Um, so Persians belong to an ethnic group known as Indo-Iranians. Um, now, these are a subset of a group known as the Aryans. And that is not Aryan in the modern misappropriated uh, white nationalistic term. Um, the Aryans are a group of people out of Central Asia who move into um, India, they move into the Iranian plains, they move into parts of Mesopotamia um, and become a really important ethno group. Um, when we get to the next unit on classical Asia, we will have a big discussion about the Aryans and their influence on India. Okay. So the people that we call as Persians are one of many nomadic tribes that come out of Central Asia into the Iranian plains. Um, the first Persian empire emerges under one specific tribe known as the Achaemenid or Achaemenid tribe. Um, the Achaemenids overthrow the other dominant tribe in the area known as the Medes or the Medes. And they quickly begin expanding their empire under uh, a king known as Cyrus the Great. And obviously, as you can tell from the moniker, the Great, uh, Cyrus had quite a bit of success. Um, in very quick succession, he is able to unite or conquer the other Persian tribes. Uh, he then quickly moves on to the Babylonians who were the largest power in Mesopotamia at the time. And he also conquers the Lydians, uh, who controlled Anatolia, modern day Turkey. Um, this brings the Persian Empire right up to the edge of Europe um, and brings them into contact with the Greeks, which we are going to talk about very, very shortly. Now, Cyrus's immediate successor, Cambyses, uh, invades and conquers Egypt. Um, once the conquest of Egypt is done, this establishes Persia as the largest of these early great classical empires. The size of their empire is not going to be outdone for several centuries until the success of the Romans. Now, that rapid Persian expansion, especially into Anatolia, brings them into conflict with the city-states in Greece. Um, the Greeks um, have also expanded into Anatolia, specifically the coast around the Strait of Bosporus and the Black Sea. And these little miniature Greek colonies come under Persian control. Um, however, the Greeks in these colonies do not like Persian control, um, and many of them rebel against the Persians, and those rebellions are brutally put down by the Persian Empire. Um, this kicks off a couple of centuries of conflict between the Greek city-states and the Persian Empire. Um, in order to bring an end to the conflict, uh, several Persian rulers, uh, namely Xerxes and Darius, or Darius, however you want to say it, um, begin what's known as the Greco-Persian Wars. And unbelievably, if you look at the grand scheme of things, uh, the Greeks are able to withstand the Persian onslaught. Um, and this leads to a pretty stunning loss for the Achaemenids. Um, and somewhat, and I say, I definitely say somewhat, unifies Greece. Now, the reason that I say somewhat there is because popular culture, especially the movie 300, 
has made it seem as if this grand sacrifice made at Thermopylae um, by these incredible Spartans somehow inspires this amazing unity among the Greeks and they, you know, come back to defeat the Persians and it creates this, you know, wonderful utopia for Greece. In reality, um, what it does is it sets off a power struggle in Greece that's going to last several hundred years. Um, And over the next couple of centuries, the Greeks not only continue fighting with the Persians, but the major Greek city-states continue fighting with each other, specifically Athens and Sparta. Now, true unity in Greece does not come from within, it comes from without. Um, Philip, the king of Macedon, which is a semi-Greek state uh, to the north of the major city-states, actually takes advantage of the political infighting in the Greek city-states to bring pretty much all of Greece under his control, Um, What isn't brought under his control is then brought under control by his son, Alexander of Macedonia, i.e. Alexander the Great. Um, Now, again, thanks to the moniker the Great, I'll give you one guess what Alexander is really good at. He's really good at conquering stuff. And under his leadership, the Greeks invade Anatolia. Um, And they defeat the Persians at a series of massive battles. Uh, They liberate Anatolia. They invade and conquer Egypt as well, eventually moving into the heart of the Persian Empire. Um, Persepolis, the capital at Susa, both quickly surrender to Alexander. And the Achaemenid dynasty, which had been the dominant power in the region for for almost 500 years, I guess, um, is pretty much left in shambles. Um, Alexander adds the Persians to his massive empire, um, moving on into invasions of Central Asia and, you know, the outer reaches of India. Um, Now, Unfortunately for Alexander, and pay attention to this theme, because it's going to be a really important theme as we go forward. Outstanding generals, outstanding conquerors, guys like Alexander the Great, guys like Genghis Khan, guys like Napoleon to a certain degree, are really, really, really good at conquering stuff. Unfortunately, once they have said stuff, they tend to be really, 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 really bad at governing and managing it. And Alexander is absolutely no different. Um, His massive empire is basically, you know, kind of neglected in favor of more conquest. Um, Alexander dies very young by the age of, I believe, 31, uh, wounded in battle, um, gets blood poisoning and dies within a matter of days after the battle. Um, and like I said, conquerors are not very good governors. Um, so Alexander's empire is left kind of to itself and in order to better manage it, Uh, His generals, his top generals, basically divide the empire into pieces, and the Persian part of Alexander's empire is left to his general, Seleucus. Now, this leads to a series of different dynasties in what we know as the Persian Empire. Um... The next one after the Achaemenids is is the Seleucid or the Seleucid dynasty. This is um, the Persian part of Alexander's empire, mainly run by Greeks. Um, However, the Greeks without Alexander do not necessarily have the ability and they don't really have the 
base of resources to main con- maintain control over Persia, so far away home from Greece. So the Seleucids are not quickly, but rather quickly overthrown by another um, of the Persian tribes, this one known as the Parthen- Parthians. Sorry. Um, the Parthians would go on to become a relatively powerful empire. Um, however, they are weakened by constant warfare with the up and coming Roman Empire. Um, the Parthians then fall apart and are overthrown by a different group, um, a different Persian tribe known as the Sassanids. And the Sassanid dynasty would then go on to rule Persia basically until the rise of Islam, which that's a couple chapters down the road, but we'll get to it. Um, So what does Persia look like? What do we need to know about this Persian empire? Um, Mainly we're going to focus on the Achaemenids because they are the first and the most memorable of these dynasties. They are the ones that build Persia into an empire. Um, Under the Achaemenids, The state is very religiously and very legally tolerant. Um, Codes of law are not as brutal as previous codes of law, especially Mesopotamian codes of law like Hammurabi. Um, Social stratification is very relevant in everyday life, but it's not as pronounced in government actions. Um, The class of an offender does not play into the into mitigating their punishment the way that it does under earlier codes of law right um however the persians are profoundly patriarchal so it's not all equality and tolerance all throughout the empire um women are heavily oppressed um and their oppression is written directly into persian law um polygamy is favored and enjoyed by the upper classes uh women are excluded from positions of government they are given minimal property rights minimal rights um in terms of marriage and sexual freedom so a lot of that patriarchy from the pre-classical area does carry on into Persian government as well. Um, Now, one of the really important things to know about Persia and the Persian government is that they are one of the first empires that we have in written history to create this massive bureaucratic system in order to help manage their empire. And that's gonna be an important theme all throughout the rest of this unit. The next unit, when we talk about Han China, it's gonna be a huge deal when we talk about the Romans. Um, But what does Persian bureaucracy look like? Um, First and foremost, um, the first step in Persian Persian bureaucracy is the satrapies, okay? These are 23 distinct provinces that the Persian empire is divided into. Each of those satrapies is managed by a royal governor known as a satrap. Um, Generally, um, they tend to be from the Persian upper classes. However, in some cases, they are conquered kings who are given the ability to, to continue to rule their land as long as they swear loyalty to the Persian emperor. Um, Another way that the Persians maintain good government across this huge empire is through the use of infrastructure, building things. Um, Citizens like having nice stuff, roads, irrigation, post offices. I mean, you name it, people like having nice stuff. And the Persians invest massively into their own infrastructure, uh, building roads to facilitate facilitate trade and communication, right? Building relay systems to facilitate uh, the movement of troops, the movement of supplies in and around the empire. Um, also, 
the Persian government employs spies. Um, these are famously known as the eyes and ears of the king. Uh, these spies work for the Persian emperor. They are loyal only to the Persian emperor. They are used to uh, regulate and manage the satrapies and the satraps to ensure that uh, they do not get too powerful. Um, another way that the Persians help to maintain good government is a lot of times they will draw officials, bureaucrats, and in some cases, even governors directly from the local population. Um, this helps to endear them to their conquered peoples. Um, this allows them to maintain some semblance of normalcy for people who are now under the power of a faraway distant government, all right? Um, now, something to know about all this is that as highly effective as Persian bureaucracy is, it is very cost prohibitive. And this is one of the things that helped bring about the end of the Achaemenids is their massive spending on infrastructure, their massive spending on government bureaucracy, then has to be passed along to someone, and that generally is the taxpayers. Um, and there is a, by the end of the Achaemenid dynasty, a massive tax burden on pretty much all of the satrapies, uh, which leads to a lack of support for the emperor, um, which kind of contributes to the relative ease that Alexander and the Greeks face when they basically carve their way through the empire. All right, um, culturally, what do we need to know about the Persians? Uh, they are very diverse. Uh, the Persians are one of the first truly multi-ethnic, multinational, multilingual empires, okay? What we come to now see as empire. Um, the Persians themselves, they blended in very easily and very readily with the conquered peoples. Um, they quickly adopted whatever customs from those people that they found advantageous to themselves. Um, Persian culture itself, especially amongst the upper classes, the people who are ethnic Persians, not just conquered people, um, is very militaristic. It's very patriarchal. Um, sons are cherished while daughters are seen as kind of a burden on the family. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to say it like this, but I guess I'll say it like this, uh, almost as if a necessary evil. OK, um, now, one thing to remember about the Persians comes out of religion, right? Early Persians are polytheistic, OK? They worship a wide array of gods. Many of the Mesopotamian ones that are well established and very popular in that area. Um, however, round about and this is a round number because there is no specific way of knowing, um, Zoroastrianism is introduced into the empire somewhere around 650 to 600 BCE. Um, that's when the prophet of Zoroastrianism, a man by the name of Zarathustra, is believed to have lived. Um, however, it is believed that the roots for Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism may go back as far as 2000 BC and that it was built on um, these Aryan Indo-Iranian customs, um, that it's, you know, somewhat related to Hinduism in, uh, in a couple of ways. Um, but with its introduction into the Persian Empire, um, Zoroastrianism becomes very popular with the upper class in the Aminikid dynasty. Um, officially becoming the state religion sometime around 450 BC. Um, once it becomes the state religion, um, becomes highly revered, becomes, you know, much more written about. We have a much greater catalog of the beliefs and the writings of it. Um, and you're going to see that tends to happen 
with state support. When a religion gains that position within a government um, where it becomes the official religion, the strength and the influence of that religion multiplies tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Right? Now, why Zoroastrianism? Why care about this religion with this strange name? Well, the main thing to remember about Zoroastrianism is that it introduces a lot of very important religious concepts that are going to find their way into other monotheistic belief systems later on down the road. Um, just a couple of these really quick uh, is the idea of eternal punishment versus eternal paradise, right? Those who do the right thing are rewarded. Those who do the wrong thing are punished. Um, the idea of a savior or a messiah, um, you know, a single solitary holy figure that will come and tip the scales in the favor of good. Uh, the idea of free will, okay, that your actions are your own and that you can choose the right path or you can choose the wrong path um, and you will be either rewarded or punished for it uh, as the gods see fit. Um, another really important concept that comes from Zoroastrianism is this idea of an eternal struggle between good and evil, uh, not just on a personal level, but on a celestial level, that there is a a a god out there that represents the good and a, and a, another figure out there, whether it be a demon or a devil or another god uh, that represents the evil. And there is this eternal struggle between the two that kind of pulls on all of us as individual people, but it also pulls on the universe in general. Um, and last but not least, probably the most important concept that Zoroastrianism introduce, although this is kind of influenced by the Hebrews and Judaism as well. You can't really give credit to just one source. Um, but the idea of a single almighty supreme God, right? In the case of Zoroastrianism, that would be the God Ahura Mazda. Um, now, here's the thing to remember about Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is broadly recognized as the first monotheistic religion, okay, in that it promotes the worship of a single god, okay, Ahura Mazda, supreme almighty being of good. Um, however, Zoroastrianism while promoting the worship of a single God, recognizes the presence of other gods. So, is this monotheism or is this not monotheism? Um, depends on how you define the word. Um, is the recognition of multiple gods enough to be polytheism? Or if you recognize those gods but only worship the one, should that be considered monotheism? Um, by modern standards, Zoroastrianism is not monotheistic. Um, modern monotheism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all staunchly, staunchly, staunchly deny the existence of any other gods but the one true God. Um, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first commandment states this pretty explicitly um so is zoroastrianism monotheism i guess you could look at it that way um if you hold it to the standard of modern monotheistic ideas then it probably falls short um but that's a debate for another day i guess all right that is it for this episode, my friends. Um, make sure that you take away kind of the important stuff from the Persians, um, the methods that they use to build such a massive empire, the methods that they use to manage such a massive empire, the cultural influence of Zoroastrianism, 
And also make sure you pay attention to the continuities in the Persian Empire, right? The continuing patriarchy, the continuing um, social stratification, those types of things. All right, that's it for this unit. Talk to you another time.